Have a look at this sequence. Where do you think this approaches? If you guessed zero, you are correct. But how can this be? What you have just seen is one example of Goodstein sequences. It is seemingly getting larger and larger, but remarkably, it will eventually come down to zero. Goodstein sequences can start with any number, and they appear to grow at an uncontrollable rate. However, they will all terminate at zero. In this video, we'll attempt to define and prove this remarkable outcome. So how are these sequences derived? We need to start with base notations of numbers. When dealing with numbers, most people use what we call base 10 notation. For example, the number 356 can be written. We can think of writing a number in base 10 as multiplying powers of 10 with numbers 0 to 9. We can write numbers in any base. For example, the base 2 notation of 1, 2, 4 is similar to the base 10 method, but this time instead of powers of 10, we now multiply powers of 2 with the numbers 0 to 1. A special kind of base notation that we need is called hereditary base notation. We start with the base notation for example, base 2 notation of 1, 2, 4. Then, all the powers must be written in base 2 notation. We continue this process of converting any number that is greater than 2 into base 2 notation, until all the values are either 0, 1, or 2. Generally, when writing a number in hereditary base n, we first write the number in base n notation. Then, we convert all powers greater than n into base n. We are now ready for Goodstein sequences. Begin with any integer, let's say 21 in hereditary base 2 notation. The second term is found by replacing all 2s with 3s, then subtracting 1, which comes to about 7.6 trillion. Then, write this value in hereditary base 3 notation. The third term is found by replacing all 3s with 4s, then subtracting 1. This value has 155 digits. Next, write this value in hereditary base 4 notation. The fourth term is found by replacing all 4s with 5s and subtracting 1. We are at 2185 digits. Then, write this value in hereditary base 5 notation, and so on. The next term of a Goodstein sequence can be found by writing the current value in hereditary base n notation, starting at n equals 2. Change every n to n plus 1, subtract 1, and continue this pattern until you reach 0. These sequences can get remarkably large, and manually calculating these terms can be very time consuming. This is a Python script which calculates Goodstein sequences. We can see which term we are at, the value, and the number of digits of the value. At the start of the video, we saw a Goodstein sequence starting with 13. As mentioned, we can start with any number. Let's try 2500. The second term has 41 digits. The third term has 620 digits. By the fourth term, we are at 10,926 digits. And by the fifth term, we are at an incredible 217,838 digits. These numbers are unimaginably large, but surprisingly, all Goodstein sequences eventually come down to zero. Let's get a different perspective on how large these sequences can get. Depending on the starting value, Goodstein sequences can get larger than Graham's number, and the growth rate can be faster than Ackermann's function. In fact, these sequences grow at such an incredible rate that the theorem literally cannot be proven using first-order arithmetic, and can only be proven using a stronger system, namely 
second order arithmetic. We will not be diving into this in this video, as it is a separate topic that deserves its own discussion, but we will focus on the proof of Goodstein's theorem within the second order system. In order to get to the proof of Goodstein's theorem, we need a bit of an understanding of sets, natural numbers, and ordinals. Set theory. Think of a set as a collection of things. For example, imagine a picnic basket, which is our set, that contains an apple, banana, and a sandwich. These items are the elements of our picnic basket. These elements themselves could be sets. For example, the sandwich, which was an element of the picnic basket, could be a set containing the elements ham, cheese, and lettuce. Subsets can be thought of a part or a section of a set. There are many ways to manipulate sets. One useful operation is the union of sets, where we combine the elements of multiple sets to create a new one. For example, if I have a set that contains an apple and a banana, and another that contains ham and cheese, the union of these sets will contain an apple, banana, ham and cheese. We can define two sets to be equal if and only if they have the same elements. If set A has the elements 1 and 2, and set B has the same elements, then we can conclude that set A is equal to set B. For our purposes, we'll define every element of a set to be unique. This means that duplicate elements can be ignored. For example, if set A has the elements 1 and 2, and set B has the elements 1, 2, and 2, we can ignore the duplicated 2 and conclude that set A is equal to set B. Let's attempt to define numbers. We will do this by defining unique sets for each natural number. We start with nothing, and I really mean nothing. The set of nothing can be our starting point, the empty set. Let's call this number 0. To find the next number, say 1, let's define a set that contains the empty set. The next number, we will call this 2, can be defined as the set that contains the empty set and the set that has the empty set as an element. You may be asking, why don't we simply define 2 as a set that contains the empty set twice? This is because we would ignore this duplicated element and therefore this set will actually be equal to what we have defined as 1. The next number can be defined as the set that contains the empty set, the set with the empty set as the element, and the set with the empty set and the set containing the empty set as elements. The pattern is that we can define a number as the set that contains all the elements of the previous set with the previous set itself added as a new element. Now that we have defined numbers, we can introduce terms such as greater or smaller. If we continue this pattern, it is conceivable that there is a set containing all the natural numbers as its elements. This is often represented as omega. We can go past omega and have omega plus 1, omega plus 2, and so on. This way of defining numbers is what we call ordinals. Ordinals focus on the order and not the size, also known as cardinals. For example, the ordinality of omega after all the natural numbers is omega plus 1. However, if we were to find the cardinality of this same set, we could simply move the omega to the front this set has the same number of elements as omega. The cardinality of omega plus 1 and omega are the same, while the ordinality is not. Before we look at the proof, we need to understand well ordering. This is where every non-empty subset of a set has a minimum element. Take the set of all integers, if I were to take the subset of this set as the minimum element is minus 2. However, what would happen if I were to take the subset as 
what would be the minimum element? There is none. No matter which integer that you think of within this set, there will always be a smaller integer. Therefore, the set of all integers is not well ordered. Have a look at the natural numbers. The minimum element of this set can be easily determined. Take a subset of this set as the minimum element is 4. In fact, for any subset, we can determine the minimum element. Since any subset of the natural numbers has a minimum element, the set of all natural numbers is well ordered. Let's have a look at the set of natural numbers that is extended to include all ordinals, including infinite ordinals. All subsets of this set also seem to have a minimum element, even though we have included infinite ordinals. Since every ordinal is included in this set, and any subset of this set has a minimum element, we can conclude that any set of ordinals is well ordered. It follows that an infinitely descending chain of ordinals cannot exist. Why? Say we have an infinitely descending chain of ordinals. Take a subset of this set. Since all sets of ordinals are well ordered, this means that there is a minimum element, say, OM, which lies somewhere here. Now, you can probably already see the issue. This subset is infinitely decreasing, which means that it will continue after OM. But we defined OM as the minimum element, which contradicts with. This shows that an infinitely descending chain of ordinals cannot exist, and we have proven this by contradiction. Say we have a machine. It takes in an input, performs some actions on it, then it outputs the result. We will program this machine so that when we input a value, that is in hereditary base n notation. It replaces all occurrences of n with omega. Let's use this to define a new sequence of ordinals alongside our Goodstein sequence. As we are replacing a finite ordinal with an infinite ordinal, clearly each value of our new sequence is greater than its corresponding Goodstein sequence term. Our Goodstein sequence is getting larger, but our new sequence seems to be decreasing. Have a look at these terms. Remember, we change each occurrence of 3 to 4, then we subtract 1. Look what happens when we put these into our machine. The process of subtracting 1 to get our next Goodstein sequence term has resulted in the second term of our new sequence to be less than the first. To get the next Goodstein sequence term, we replace 4s with 5s, then subtract 1. Similar thing happens in the new sequence. Subtracting 1 has caused the next term in our new sequence to be less than its previous term. This seems like a reasonable argument for the decreasing nature of our new sequence. But let us dig deeper. We can focus on the smallest unit in each of our terms. Why? because the only difference between a term and its next term will be caused by the act of subtracting 1, which can only affect the smallest unit. All other units will stay the same in our new sequence. This occurs because the increase of the base in our Goodstein sequence is negated by our machine, which converts the current base to omega. There are two scenarios that our smallest unit can land on in our new sequence. When it is a finite ordinal, we can clearly see that subtracting 1 will cause the next term to be smaller. The second scenario is when the smallest unit is an infinite ordinal. We can see the act of subtracting 1 has actually caused this infinite ordinal to become a finite ordinal. Since the smallest unit has dropped from being an infinite ordinal to a finite ordinal, we can safely assume that the next term will decrease. One exception is when the smallest unit has an exponent. Remember, we increase the base from 3 to 4, subtract 1, then write this number in hereditary base 4. The decreasing nature is not so obvious compared to the previous scenarios. But by looking at the highest power, we can deduce the next term has in fact decreased. By the definition of base notation, 
we can see that when two numbers are written in the same base n notation, the value with the highest power is the greater number. From this, we can conclude that a term in our new sequence will always be greater than its next term, unless it is zero where it must terminate, as there are no ordinals less than zero. In other words, this new sequence is decreasing. Just a quick recap. We began with well ordering, where every non-empty subset of a set has a minimum element. By this definition, we saw that the set of all natural numbers is well ordered. We extended this to all ordinals to show that any set of ordinals is well ordered. Then, we proved that an infinitely descending chain of ordinals cannot exist. This means that our new sequence of ordinals, which we have proven to be decreasing, cannot be infinite. Hence, it must terminate. So how does this prove that our Goodstein sequence also terminates? The first explanation is that since our new sequence eventually reaches zero, and each new sequence term is greater than its corresponding Goodstein sequence term, we can deduce that our Goodstein sequence will also eventually come down to zero. I think this is a fair conclusion, but the more accepted explanation is that since the way we found our new sequence was by inputting a Goodstein sequence term into our machine, the only way the output can be zero is if the inputted Goodstein sequence term is also zero. This truly is a remarkable outcome that is difficult to comprehend. But somehow, the process of subtracting one eventually overcomes the increasing bases. This shows that Goodstein sequences must terminate.